Good to have everybody this morning. Amen. Good to be here. All right, if you'll take your Bible, turn to Revelation 14, with, or 7 rather, then 14. Revelation chapter number 7. And uh, start this morning. I... Uh, we're going to be covering some contemporary issues, very important, very, very important, especially as it relates to Bible prophecy and the existence of a little old country right over there on the eastern shore of the Mediterranean Sea, tiny in comparison to that huge land mass north of it that covers six or seven time zones. Do you know what I'm talking about? Russia. And uh, that little country on the eastern coast Mediterranean is Israel, tiny, surrounded by a vast array of Arab countries. Father, in thy name we pray, give me wisdom, Lord, gift of teaching. Open our hearts to the Heavenly Father as we presented with the truth. May we receive the truth, then may we rejoice in the truth. In thy name we pray, amen. All right, now look at Revelation chapter number 7. And verse number 5. Of the tribe of Judah sealed 12,000. Tribe of Reuben sealed 12,000. Tribe of Gad sealed 12,000. Tribe of Asher 12,000. Tribe of Neph Nephthalim 12,000. Manasseh 12,000. Simeon 12,000. Levi 12,000. Issachar 12,000. Zebulun 12,000. Joseph 12,000. Benjamin 12,000. The names are just a little different because of the fact that some prophecies were fulfilled as it relates to uh, 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 the, uh, some of the tribes of Israel and the reason we have some names show up here. But the bottom line is this. In the book of Revelation, chapters number 7 and 14, you have the 12 tribes of Israel. All right, now, this was written in 90 A.D. 90 A.D. This was, this was written well into the uh, church age and it was written well into the writings of the Apostle Paul because Paul had already been addressing the churches you know that you know that 90 AD 95 AD when the book of Revelation was written uh, consummates finishes brings to completion the canon of Scripture all right so now therefore if you were a believing Christian in 90 AD had in your hand say the book of first Thessalonians and then you have, you have access to the book of Revelation. Then you have two identities before you. You have the identity of the church of God. You know the church is real. You know the church is there. You know the church is made up of Jew and Gentile, don't you? You know that. And you know the apostle said in 1 Corinthians, he said, to the Jew first, also the Greek. All right. So they retain their racial characteristics until they're born again. And then once they are in Christ, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, bond, free, so forth and so on. All right. But then on the other hand, in the book of Revelation, you have all this talk about the 12 tribes of Israel. So what is it you'd say to yourself? Therefore, it's obvious that the church does not replace the 12 tribes of Israel. That Israel must have its identity. Must be. Now, of course, if you, if you go to one of the mainline Protestant denominations where they've replaced Israel with the church, we call it replacement theology, then you'd be saying, well, the 12 tribes of Israel represent the church. And when you get into that, folks, you can make anything represent anything. And once you make anything represent anything, nothing has any meaning whatsoever. Amen. So I believe that Israel as an entity or as a people will still exist Amen. into the future. I believe that's necessary. I believe it's necessary for Bible prophecy to be fulfilled. Then when you come to the book of Romans, chapter number 11, and you study that on your own at home, you'll see that the apostle is talking about, Hath God cast away his people, which he foreknew, his people, he said, I am an Israelite, not Jew, Israelite, of the tribe of Benjamin, so forth and so on. So he said, all Israel shall be saved, speaking about a future event. Now, I've said all of that to say this. It's obvious from Scripture that there will be some place called Israel. Amen. And some people who identify themselves as Israelites and belonging to Israel. May 14, 1948. Uh, David Ben-Gurion stood up before his, uh, for his people and declared Israel to be a sovereign nation once again. After, after hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years of being driven from their land 
and uh, by no choice of their own. And so he declared Israel to be a sovereign nation, May 14, 1948. Immediately they entered into a war, which was the uh, War of uh, Independence. That's what it was called. And Arab nations surrounding them attacked them. And this little fledgling group of people and fledgling army defeated them. Of course, they had a big one on their side, the Almighty. Since that time, and by the way, Harry Truman was the president of the United States. He became the president when uh, Franklin Roosevelt died in his fourth term. Then he was reelected to office. Harry Truman was the president, and Harry Truman immediately recognized the sovereignty of Israel, which gave them credibility then. When the moment he did that, the moment the United States recognized him, so did Soviet Russia. As a matter of fact, Soviet Russia is the one who brought the, uh, who brought the declaration for the UN to recognize them. Believe it or not, it was Soviet Russia. And uh, uh, so they recognized them, and, and, and Truman, uh, Truman uh, threw the weight of the United States behind it. And so the United States and Russia now, the two major powers in the world, have recognized Israel as a sovereign nation, May 14, 1948. So in the eyes of the world, it's no longer a rogue nation, a bunch of people over there declaring something that's not a reality. They are a sovereign nation. That's been the case. Ever since then, every president of the United States has supported in one degree or another Israel. Some haven't been as strong as others, but they have supported them. The Arab nations have always been Israel's enemy. Hamas, which, is, uh, which you've seen in the news lately because of this uh, flotilla that came out of uh, Turkey, Hamas is the sworn enemy of Israel, and in their constitution, they declare that they will not cease until Israel ceases being a nation. So therefore, when you negotiate with Hamas, if the United States recognizes Hamas, then the United States is recognizing a terrorist organization whose stated goal is to do away with the existence of Israel. That's fact. So every American president since uh, Harry Truman uh, has recognized Israel's sovereignty, a right to exist. Uh, some, some have been very good. Richard Nixon stepped in and, and gave arms and supplies to Israel when they were at one of their darkest points. And uh, God has used the American presidency. He's used America. He's used America to support Israel. Now, something has drastically changed just recently. If you're not aware of this, you need to be. You need to understand what's going on. A non-proliferation uh, treaty, mean, to proliferate means to continue to build, to advance, to make bigger and stronger and so forth. A non-proliferation treaty means that we're going to stop building, we're going to cut back, and we're going to literally do away with. The Arabs have always wanted what they call, quote, unquote, a nuclear-free zone in the Middle East. What is a nuclear-free zone? It's like a gun-free zone. It's for all of the puppets to be lined up in a row for the killer to come in and kill. If you're going to murder, folks, a law that says it's a gun-free zone is meaningless. How many agree with that? Amen. That's only for people who don't have any sense. A nuclear-free zone, therefore, means that you give up your right to defend yourself and you put your trust in somebody somewhere, whoever it might be. And so, therefore, if all of the nations in the Middle East uh, disarm themselves and have no nuclear weapons then uh, we don't have to worry about nuclear war anymore. you believe that? What if everybody in Knoxville said, I'll tell you what, we're going to bring all of our guns and lay them at the foot of the chief of police, and we're all going to be safe from henceforth, and leave our doors unlocked at night, and drive to any part of town we want to, and the government will take care of us. Do you believe that? You may have a Ph.D. and an IQ of 175. You're ready for the funny farm Amen. if you believe that. Amen. All right. All right. Uh, one of the old writers said, God's on the side with the biggest guns. <laughs> and he was a Christian that said that. Now, I'm not saying that's true, but that was an observation. God's on the side who has the biggest guns. Bottom line is this. The President of the United States has just signed on to a nuclear non-proliferation treaty and that treaty has singled out Israel by name in that treaty and didn't say a word about Iran in that treaty 
And the Arabs apparently are getting what they wanted. And the purpose of the treaty is that Israel will disarm itself of its nuclear weapons and trust somebody when they do that. And the, uh, you can find this all over the Internet. I've got from the Jewish press. I have an article on it. The, Jewish po the Jerusalem Post has an article on it. The Washington Post also prints... Uh, Articles by a man named Charles Krauthammer. How many ever heard of this man? I don't know if I always agree with what Mr. Krauthammer says, but I'm going to guarantee you one thing. He's a smart man. This, uh, the, uh, the president has signed on to the new, and by, by the way, they had, they, had, uh, they had assured Israel they would not sign this treaty, then turned right around and signed it. Now listen to the consummate politician. Once Mr. Obama signed on to it, the U.S. President Barack Obama on Saturday welcomed the balanced nuclear non-proliferation accord reached Friday at a U.N. conference, but criticized the singling out of Israel in the document. Obama said the document, quote, includes balanced and practical steps that will advance non-proliferation nuclear disarmament and peaceful uses of nuclear energy, which are critical pillars of the global non-proliferation -pro regime. But he said, we strongly oppose efforts to single out Israel and will oppose actions that jeopardize Israel's national security. The UN on Friday called on Israel to become a member of the non nuclear non-proliferation treaty and to allow inspection of its nuclear sites. In other words, identify every one of them and identify where they are so that all the Arab countries can know exactly where to strike if they want to wipe them from the face of the earth. All right. Now, there are recognized nuclear states. Now, what that means is that these are the recognized nuclear states in the world. Therefore, they are legitimate nuclear states and have a right to be nuclear states. What are they? United States, Russia, Britain, France, and China. Would you trust China? Ask Douglas MacArthur about China and Korea when the Chinese overflowed that border, when the U.S. troops had already defeated the North Koreans and had already driven them out, and, you know, they, drove, they drove them out of the south, got to the north, and the Chinese by the hundreds of thousands came flooding across that border. And that's when our boys were circled up there in North Korea and trapped and, uh, because they were outnumbered sometimes a hundred to one. That's what happened. That's what China did. And, of course, we know what China did, too, in the Vietnam War. Would you trust China? I wouldn't trust China as far as I could throw them. What about Russia? Would you trust Russia? Russia's got nuclear weapons. Would you, all the treaties that we've ever signed with, with Russia, they're not, they're not worth the paper they're written on. Would you trust Russia? I don't trust Russia. What about now Great Britain, for the most part, has been an ally of the United States? Under, under uh, Margaret Thatcher and uh, President Reagan, probably the closest relationship the two nations have ever had. And Great Britain refused under Margaret Thatcher to become part of the euro, which is collapsing right now. We'll talk about that in just a moment. Great Britain kept its pound sterling. And because of that, it doesn't, uh, it's not in the same mess that, say, for example, you just heard it recently, there's another, used to be a, a Eastern Bloc country that's about to go belly up over there. That's Hungary. And, and you see what's happened in Greece. These countries are falling like dominoes. What's happening? The monetary system is, is, is poison. Somebody's going to have to step in and shore this up and change it. You know what Russia said? Russia has said, so has China and others, that the euro is dead. It's finished. It's time for something else. We have France. Would you trust France? No, I wouldn't trust France in a heartbeat. No, I wouldn't trust France. So the only one that we, you, 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 could, you could say that there's, there's any trust with would be Great Britain. And the reason for that is because our first cousins, <laughs> that's, where, that's where the country came from to start with, Great Britain. All right? And they have a, they have a parliamentary form of government. They have freedoms in Great Britain that, that most other people in the world do not uh, enjoy except America. And our form of government is a spinoff of their form of government. And our form of law is definitely a spinoff of their law. So anyway, <clears throat> you have the United States, Russia, Britain, France, and China. Who's that leave out, though? Huh? Some more people got nuclear weapons. 
How about North Korea? How about India? How about Pakistan? How about Iran? They're working hard day and night. What about all these people? You see, they singled Israel out. Why? Because have you not noticed lately all of the hatred that has been directed toward Israel? This flotilla that left Turkey, this was a humanitarian flotilla. No, it wasn't. This flotilla left Turkey for one stated goal, to bust the uh, embargo against Gaza. Why does Israel have an embargo against Gaza? Because they've been shipping weapons from Iran into Gaza. And they turn around and fire those weapons out of Gaza over into Israel and kill women and children with them. That's why. Would the United States let them, uh, them they, would, that, would they let them bring uh, weapons like that into Mexico if they were firing them from Mexico over into uh, that good governor down there in Arizona? She ought to run for president. I'd vote for her. She's, you know why? Because she cares for the people of Arizona, apparently. Yeah, what's her name? Yeah. Yeah. But what if they were firing rockets over? Do you think the United States would, let that, would settle for that? Of course not. They've got a double standard. And the double standard is Israel is held to one standard and the world's held to another standard. There's only one country in the Middle East that has freedom and democracy, and that's Israel. Period. Period. And the rest of them are Arab dictatorships, and if, if and once Sharia law comes in, and once they have the power and they can do it, there is only one faith in that country, and that is Islam. Period. That's just the way it is. All right, so what's going on? Well, what's going on is that we have a president who is, who is reaching out to the Arabs, apparently trying to build some kind of an Arab coalition to support with this country, and in doing so, he's throwing Israel to the wolves. By throwing Israel to the wolves, he's going to pay a supreme price. Amen. Do you know why? Now think about it for a minute. Think about it for a minute. Who would he answer to? He answers to the Almighty. That's who he answers to. His life, my life, your life, every life on the face of this earth is in his hand. He must answer to him. But it brings you down to the point that the Bible makes on this. And that is, you shall be hated for all, by all men. That Matthew chapter number 24 talking about that hatred is talking about the hatred for the Jew. The tribulation is the time of Jacob's trouble. The coming seven years, and it's soon to come, it's going to come soon, is the time of Israel's persecution. Like it's never been persecuted before to such an extent it has to flee. He says, pray, pray your flight be not on the Sabbath day. He's not talking about Christians. Christians don't uh, have the Sabbath day the Jew does. The, Jew, the Sabbath the Sabbath's never changed. From Friday night sunset until Saturday night sunset is the Sabbath day. And the Jew, the, the Orthodox Jew, still recognizes the Sabbath day. And he wouldn't be, he, he'd be breaking his law to flee on the Sabbath day. So all of these warnings in here about, about enormous persecution are directed toward the Jews who are going to be persecuted in the last days. So your position, your position this morning be very, should be very clear as to who you support. Now the reason I pulled out Krauthammer, his, uh, he titles his article, Those Troublesome Jews. That's what he called it. This man's a thinker. Here's what Leslie, quotes Leslie Gelb, former president of the Council on Foreign Relations, writes, The blockade is not just perfectly rational, it is perfectly legal. Gaza under Hamas is a self-declared enemy of Israel, a declaration backed up by more than 4,000 rockets fired at Israeli civilian territory. Yet having pledged itself to unceasing belligerency, Hamas claims victimhood when Israel imposes a blockade to prevent Hamas from arming itself with still more rockets. And then he goes into what uh, the United States did to blockade Germany and Japan during World War II and so forth. But his conclusion is, what, uh, is what's very interesting. Listen carefully to what this man says. He talks about the defenses that Israel has. They have a forward defense, an active defense, and a passive defense. And what he's saying is that the United States, if Israel agrees to this non-proliferation treaty, has, has literally given up all of its defenses. It has no defense left. And if you want to create a war, if you want to start a war, you disarm one, per one party. You've started a war because human nature will create the war. They'll take what they can. Here's what he said. Here's what's left. 
What's left? Nothing. The whole point of this relentless international campaign is to deprive Israel of any legitimate form of self-defense. Why just last week the Obama administration joined the jackals and reversed four decades of U.S. practice by signing onto a consensus document that singles out Israel's possession of nuclear weapons, thus delegitimizing Israel's very last line of defense, deterrence. The world is tired of these troublesome Jews. Six million, that number again, hard by the Mediterranean, refusing every invitation to national suicide, for which they are relentlessly demonized, ghettoized, and constrained from defending themselves, even as the more committed anti-Zionist, Iran in particular, openly prepare a more final solution. You know what this man just said? He just said that by disarming Israel, if they can, if they do disarm it, they will create the largest Mideast nuclear war that this, and, and if it's nuclear war, it will be, this world has ever known. They will thrust the world into World War III. That's exactly what he's saying. That's exactly what he's saying. And that's exactly what's going to happen. And it's going to be that thrusting the world into World War III that allows the Antichrist to rise to power. For he comes to power on the heels of a, of a situation where you've got to do something, anything. And America's attitude toward Israel has changed. At one time, America considered Israel, because, because at one time, America had far more Christians in it than it does now. You are a distinct minority. You need to understand that. You're not, certainly not, no majority. If this nation had 50 million Christians, 50 million, that's a lot of million. That's a lot of Christians, isn't it? That's a lot. That's a lot, all right? How many people are in America? They're running a census right now. Three, 300, maybe 350, maybe, well, yeah, maybe, maybe 600 million by the time they count all the Mexicans that come up here, the illegal alien. Who knows? But, <laughs> but 350 million, okay? All right. <laughs> Do you know how many votes Mr. Obama got in the last election? I told you the other day. 63 million. And uh, uh, Senator from Arizona, McCain, you know what he got? He got 55 million. All right, 55 to 63 million. All right, if you had 50 million Christians in this country that just came out of a prayer meeting, had their head on right, who do you think they'd vote for? If you had, listen, if you had 50 million Christians in this country that, that, that were walking with God and had some sense and walking in the light and knew, knew where they were coming from, where they were going, they could put any man in office. It would be the largest voting block this nation knows. You could elect anybody you wanted to elect. No question about it. But look who, got, look who they put in. The man that is in office right now, and I want to be as honest and fair with him as I can be, is an antichrist. He is an antichrist. No question about it. No question about it whatsoever. And a lot of people believe he's a closet Muslim, and he probably is. But he is certainly an antichrist. Now, he wouldn't say that. He'd say he's a believer in Christ. But it gets into semantics. You know what semantics is? That's, that's one of those little touchy words. Semantics is when I say light and you say light, we're talking about different things. Okay? In other words, if he says Jesus and I say Jesus, my Jesus is not his Jesus. My Christ is not his Christ. My truth is not his truth. He believes in relative truth. I believe in absolute truth. See? It's like the government school system. Or, I mean, you call them the public school system? The government school system? That's what they are? They've just told you that your Bible is a myth. That's what they told you. If the story of creation is a myth, then the, rest, then the Lord Jesus Christ is all messed up because he believed in creation. He should. He's the one that did it. So they believe the Bible's a myth. If they believe it's a myth, then what do they believe about you? Do you see how slick they are and cunning? They would, never, they would never come out to your face and look at you and say, you're a fool. You're an ignorant, backwoods, uh, illiterate uh, nimcompoop. <laughs> They'd never do that. But what they will do is throw words around to communicate among themselves the fact that you are a, uh, you are a uh, what's a good word for it? I mean, somebody that believes a, believes a myth. 
Yeah. What, 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 what is a person who believes a myth? Deluded. See? If you believe that, if you believe in the eternity of matter, do you believe in the eternity of matter? Do you believe matter has always existed? Do you believe as far back as far back can be far back into eternity past, there's always been a creation? So you believe it came into existence somewhere? It's either always been or it came into existence or it doesn't exist. Now, if you, belong, if you live in India, <laughs> among the Hindu, you know, everything is relative, relative there. And to them, they can just dismiss the reality and say, well, that's not a reality. That doesn't exist. That's Hinduism. That, that's Hinduism. Okay. So if it came into existence, then it either came into existence of its own. Do you really believe that? Do you believe that? Or do you believe that there's an almighty creator God? Now, just think about the alternative. Let's just look at it in a rational sense. I'm a Bible-believing Christian. I mean, you know that. You know what I believe. But let's just look at it rationally. If it hasn't always existed, then it came into existence. If it didn't come into existence by the hand of God, how did it do it? Got any ideas? Think about it a minute. This is what they're teaching your kids in public school system. And here's what they do. They want their children. Because they want to create, they want to mold the next generation, and they want to mold their mind. If they can mold their mind, they mold the person, and they're creating a good citizen of the world, not an American, no longer, no longer sovereign nation, no longer the founding fathers, no longer all the things that we learned when we went to high school about the history of America. No longer none of that. No, these are, these are villains now. Now we're world citizens, and everything is looked at in a world perspective. That's what they're creating. Isn't that a shame? That's what they're doing. And it didn't happen overnight. And the sad thing is that the church bought into it. They've bought into it. So if we have the euro collapsing and we have the Bilderbergers meeting right now, and for your information, you ought to try to get in and say, boys, I'd like to sit in on your meeting. You don't care, do you? I thought I might bring along a camera and a recorder here and take notes and, and just uh, cover what you're talking about. They've got armed guards that will stop you. Do you know what the Bilderbergers are doing right now? They're talking about the future of the world. Do you know what Mr. Obama said the other day when he addressed the cadets at West Point? He used the term a new international order. They feel like that they've come to the point now to where it's no longer necessary to operate clandestinely. Now it's all out in the public. It's for the public consumption. Because reason? Because the church is no longer, is no longer an instrument. It's no longer an obstacle. Most of the church, is, the only thing they care about is prosperity, and that's all. As long as they get that, they're happy. And six-pack Joe out here that goes to work every day, that's all he cares about, six-pack and sex, he's happy. Is that not true? That's the truth. So the church is the salt of the earth, the light of the world. You need to know what's going on. He said that day will not come upon you unawares. He said you're not children of the night. So what's happening then? Right now the Bilderbergers are working toward what needs to be done to finalize the bringing together of a one world government. That oil rig down there in the Gulf of Mexico is not an oil refinery. There's a big difference. An oil refinery takes crude oil and through a process they call cracking, they take that crude oil and they produce kerosene, they produce diesel fuel, they produce gasoline and all of that from that crude oil. And it's like a sitting bomb because gasoline vapors will blow up, folks. But that's not a refinery. What is it? It's a pumping station. They pump oil up, up uh, out, of, out, of the, you know, out of the well there. And it blew up. It makes you wonder if it wasn't sabotaged. Now here's why you wonder. Here's what to look for. You can always tell who did it by who prospered from it. See what it produces. See what happens. Now, you've got an awful lot of people down there in the Gulf Coast right now. Good people, hard-working people that are hurting right now. They're suffering. Those fishermen down there, folks, they don't hand them money. They go out and work hard to fish. That's hard work. And they're down there suffering right now. And, and uh, people down there are hurting. And the people in the, in, the, in the hotel and motel industry and all the rest of the, that are affected by that. All these people are affected by it. There's something big going on in the Gulf of Mexico. And, and I wonder what's coming out of it. After all these days, 
of the technology that we say we have, and yet we still, they've only got about 20% of that siphoned off, and about 80% of it's still going into the Gulf. And there's a stream, some kind of a Gulf stream, that could pick that up and carry it up the East Coast. And if it carries it up the East Coast and, and, and catches it right, it could be hitting the shores of uh, North Carolina, South Carolina, and on up into, good knows, who knows, New England, New York, uh, ever, ever state, Maine, that, that borders the ocean, the Atlantic. It could happen. In plain words, the whole nation outside of the Pacific could be covered with a rim of oil. I read one scholar, and he said this could go on for years. If that goes on for years and that oil keeps piling up like that, it's no longer a disaster. It is an absolute, uh, well, I don't know what you'd call it, just literally destroy the nation because something's got to be done. And Obama's playing politics with it. He's playing politics. Something's going to have to be done. This thing right here could be his Achilles heel. It'd go one of two ways. If it doesn't get fixed, Obama's finished because he will ultimately get the blame for it. If the oil industry cannot fix it, but Obama does fix it, then he rises up as the hero. Makes you wonder what's going on, doesn't it? Makes you wonder why that the federal government steps back and lets the oil industry take care of something that obvious to, obviously to this point the oil industry hasn't been able to do. And the federal government is just kind of hands off. They say they're collaborating, you know, and they're you know, discussing, and the scientists are saying that's nothing. The federal government has not put their ships out there. They have not put their equipment out there, and they have not put their men out there. They're not the ones doing it. BP's doing it. And look at BP. Do they have any vested interest in losing all of this oil and paying all this money out, and it could bankrupt that country? I mean, that company? Is, do, do, they, do they have a vested interest in that? No. That's British Petroleum, by the way. You saw the CEO, and he's, he's not from around here. <laughs> you can tell by the way he talks. He's, he's, he's a Brit. And, uh, and I think he was as gen sincere and genuine as he can be when he addressed the nation and said, I'm, you know, we're sorry this has happened. We're doing everything we can to clean it up, everything we can to change it. I agree with him. I, think he, I believe, he's, I believe he's, he's, he's speaking in, in truth. But there, must be, there may be something going on a whole lot bigger than him. There may be some element there watching what's going on and waiting for the moment when they step in. So just watch it and see. Now here's the thing, though. What could that do to the nation and what could that do to the second coming of Christ and what's that got to do with the future? You know what happened in 911 when those Arabs flew those planes, if that's what happened. And I'm not sure what happened. I know planes hit those two trade towers, but I don't know who was behind it. How many of you in here this morning really believe you know who's behind it? How many of you have a feeling this morning that there was something going on and you don't know all about it yet? Most people do. And I'm not blaming anybody. I'm just saying there's too much going on. But look what happened. The Patriot Act. Now they can spy on you. They can watch every move you make. And, you, and the arms issue, the weapons, and all that. This is coming out of this. It's changed the country. It's changed the country from, to the point to where it's pre-911 and, and post-911. Nation's no longer the same. And they call it a false flag. I've heard that term thrown around. It may be that what happened down here in the Gulf of Mexico is a false flag. It could be that that's happened to cover up something else that's going to happen or the preview of what's going to happen. Who knows? Who knows? Have you noticed the price of gasoline lately? That's strange. Millions of barrels of oil is going into the Gulf of Mexico, and they've told you, they've brainwashed us into believing that the price of gasoline is based upon the price of crude oil. And it's strange how that if you're pumping all this oil into the Gulf of Mexico, and you don't have as much as you had before, yet the price of gasoline is going down. You see what's going on? Do you believe them? How many of you folks in here this morning have total confidence to go home, sleep all night long like a baby, just believe the government, hallelujah, I'm safe? I believe the government. <laughs> no, you don't. You don't believe them. That's why the Lord said, render to Caesar that which is Caesar's. Folks, let me say this, okay? This is a big deal about this non-proliferation treaty, and they're trying to get Israel to sign on for their own destruction. Whoever comes against Israel is the Antichrist. Make no mistake about it. And I'm not saying that our president is. 
He is an antichrist in the sense that he denies Christ, who he is. But as far as being the antichrist, the man of sin, don't know that yet. Now here's what's happening. Jack Van Impey sent out, and I'm not a big supporter of Jack Van Impey, but somebody handed me this last week. And Jack Van Impey sent a thing out across the country saying that he had read in, or had, it had been reported in Israel My Glory, which is a Christian magazine, that, uh, that uh, they are going to push hard to make it a hate crime if you say that Jesus is the only way. How many of you got that letter from Mr. Van Impey? That Jesus is the only way. It has nothing to do with sodomy. It just has to do with the gospel. That Jesus is the only way. All right. It becomes a hate speech, which becomes hate crime, which is an absolute violation of the First Amendment of the Constitution. It takes your free speech away. Now, here's, here's what will happen. If they're able to ram that through and make it hate speech to preach that Jesus is the only way, get ready. The second thing that will be rammed through will be any speech criticizing the government and the powers that be. He, that's what's coming. It will be, be an electorate. It will be a nation where you cannot speak. You cannot say anything in criticism. What happens? If you can no longer criticize the government, how do you run for office? How do you bring the issues up? How do you, how, what happens then is that you have a dictatorship established what they use the word tacitly. In other words, it's not a dictatorship in the sense that you say you are, but you have control. This is like political correctness. You see, you, you, are, you, you shut people up because they know if they say something, they can lose their job. Or they can be sued. That's what's going on. And Mr. Van Impey said 10 years ago, he never thought for, in his life that something like that would happen. Well, I did. I've seen it coming a long way back. When in Canada has already passed the law, and it's been a law in Canada for some time now that you can't preach about sodomy and so forth. Any time that they begin to get and here's here's another here's another element to think about involved in this. If the Bible is a myth, okay, and that's the government position. How many believe that the government position is the Bible is a myth? Do they teach it in the government school system? Who supports the government? I mean, who supports the school system? The government. No, you say, no, you say the taxpayers do. Where does the government get its money? It gets it from the taxpayer. The government supports the school system. The school system tells you that your Bible is a myth. All right. Therefore, they have demonized you. By telling you the Bible is a myth, they've, they've, put a, they've put a mantle over you. They've, said, they've identified you as a certain group of radical people who are ignorant people because you believe the Bible is, is, is the Word of God, you know, and it's not a myth. They've, they've, it's, they've made you a radical, okay? So therefore, by doing that, in the eyes of the people in the country, if you believe the Bible is the Word of God and they've already said it's a myth, then when they come along and you, and you get up and you start preaching about about Jesus being the only way, and you preach about Sodomite and so forth and that, they'll say to the country, see how these radical ignoramuses preach from a book that is full of myths? So it's awful easy then to take the Christians and throw them to the lions. Do you believe they'd ever do that in this country? That's amazing. You really do believe they'd do that? Yeah, I do. I do. I believe they would. All right, so I encourage you to go back and vote for Obama. Really? Really? Don't tell me about your revivals and your camp meetings and your move of God after you've been to the polls and voted. Don't want to hear it. You've insulted me. That's an insult. No, don't tell me about that. And this is not saying that the Republican Party is the greatest thing in the world either. They got a bunch of dogs on there too. But find somebody somewhere that's in. And Sarah Palin was pretty close. I believe Sarah Palin's a Christian woman. And I say, how do you know? Because the press demonized her. They went after her jugular. That's why I believe she's Christian. They hate her. Find out who the government hates. I'm all for them. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs>
<laughs> All right. The men in black will come and get me tonight, and they'll take me away. And so, uh, will you visit me in jail? <laughs> yes, ma'am. I'm glad to hear that, and I, I, uh, I know he was definitely a friend of Israel. I know he's a supporter of Israel. Yes, sir. Bush said that? Well, see, that's the problem. Yeah, I know. I heard her the other day. I heard her position, yeah. Uh, that's why when I said that about Mr. Krauthammer, this is not an endorsement of Charles Krauthammer. This is simply taking what he said. If it's the truth, it's the truth. Every once in a while, the devil slip up and tell the truth. He did. He quoted the truth. He quoted it to the Lord. He said, He shall give his angels charge over thee, lest thou should dash thy foot against a stone. He said, He shall bear thee up. Well, that's the truth, but he misapplied it. All right. All right, so when you're saved, born again, washed in the blood, what gets washed in the blood? Soul or spirit? How many say soul? All right. All right, turn to Revelation 1. We'll settle this difficult issue right now. <laughs> And then 1 John 1. Okay. Revelation 1 5. From Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, to him that loved us and washed us from our sins in His own blood. Now we've got a key here. He washed us from our sins. 1 John 1, verse 7. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ His Son cleanseth. That cleanseth is ever-present tense, is cleansing us from all sin. So the blood is being applied continuously to what? soul. Exactly. You see, uh, the blood was absolutely necessary to be shed for your, for your spirit to be born again. All right? Your spirit was born of God. Your spirit is born of God. The efficacy of the blood is applied directly to the spirit or you never could have been born again. That was absolutely necessary. But the actual cleansing, the cleansing, the blood cleanses the soul. Why? Because the soul can either be answering to the spirit or to the flesh. The soul is the intermediary. The soul one day can be walking in perfect fellowship and communion and light with God, having been washed in the blood, walking in light, walking in fellowship. Next day, that soul can begin to yield to the fiery darts of the devil, to temptations from about and so forth. That soul can, can begin to waver and begin to fall back. That soul can begin to hear the lie and receive and receive the lie and when that happens that soul must be restored that soul must be cleansed and the only way for the soul to be cleansed is by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ it's absolutely necessary for the soul to be cleansed but still doesn't answer the question completely go ahead brother Right, right. But you're, yeah, yeah. And, well, the washing, it ha if you'll notice the, the context there, of what tense is that in? What, was that present or is that a past act, final act, complete act? Spirit was not regenerated. Spirit was born again. It came into, here's, here's the best way to put it. Your spirit did not exist 
until you were born again. That spirit came into existence by the new birth. That's why it's called a birth. Yeah, see, didn't exist. Yes, sir. Yes, it does. Leviticus 17, verse 11. The life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you as an atonement for the soul. And that, but that's an Old Testament doctrine, but it still applies to the soul. We've run out of time, folks, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll uh, go again next week. Brother Lee dismisses.